Hello, nerdy Asian guy. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Not at all. Typos are part of the part of online uh, interaction. Okay, so here's our first game. Jay Bent plays Paolo Luigi. Both are strong players. It's 2,000 rated players, and it was a 10-minute game on chess.com. So let's see how this one went. So Jay Bent is black. So we'll look at it from his perspective. And already I'm a big fan of Jay Bent, uh, having played the King's Indian defense, which I've played before. And this is, uh, well, Botmanek always thought knight c3 and the three pawns were the best way to attack the King's Indian defense. Not sure if that's still the case nowadays, but uh, it's, it's, it's the classical way of attacking the King's Indian defense, because you, you have the big center. Now, one thing that I would say that I feel is a little, uh, let's say, I don't want to say offbeat, but uh, I don't like this knight on f3. So if I were black, I'd be going for bishop to g4. And then trying to get knight c6. But of course, that's just a variation. I mean, there's so many ways to play this, but that's, that's what I like to do. But uh, let's see what Jay Bent did. Castling. Bishop to d3. Yeah, I was thinking about this when I went through the game earlier. Um, that's very unusual move. But it kind of makes sense to me. Because white, once black has decided uh, their pawn break, whether it's c5 or e5, white often is going to lock it up. And in the king's Indian defense. White does like to have the bishop on d3 because black often goes for an f5 pawn break. And so the bishop is quite useful for attacking that square and uh, trading off maybe light squared bishops. So although it looks a little strange, uh, I'm a little surprised that that's not played more often. It does take away the queen from protecting the d4 square. But I don't think that's a big issue for white. Okay, nerdy Asian guy says thinks that bishop d3 is the second most popular after bishop to e2. It's possible. It's just uh, not a move that I see when, when people play it against me. But it does make a lot of sense. I agree with Jay Bent. I, I do think it's better off on d3. Okay, knight b to d7. Okay, so black is not yet revealing their plan, whether they're going to go e5 or c5. They're, they're preparing it. Castles. And now rook e8. Now notice I don't have the engine on. I do have the eval bar, which is which is the engine, but I don't have the lines. So I'm I'm doing this with my own my own head, my own engine, my flawed engine. So rookie eight, I'm I'm wondering about. Yeah, I don't think e5 quite works here. I'm just thinking about my own experience when I've played like rookie eight. Mind you, these are predominantly blitz games that I play. White has sometimes thrown in e5. And I'm wondering here, see, I think you're compelled to take on e5 because if you don't, I mean, where's this knight going? The knight has to go to either here or here and both squares, the knight is vulnerable. 
knight h5, I think we're losing the knight to g4. And knight g4, well, you could kick it to a pretty bad square on h6. But maybe it could come back to play on f5. I don't know. But if we are compelled to take, and let's say we go knight g4 here, uh, it looks like, yes, we're going to win this pawn because we have three guys on it. White only has one. But I think this is a, a useful case where white can sack a pawn. And so, like, this is very awkward for black. So, despite the fact that white is down a pawn, it really doesn't matter because this essentially is like one big pawn. So I was just curious if, if white could have tried e5 there. Now the thing in, in this position, before you play rook e8, um, let's say just for the sake of discussion that black plays a c6. This is what I like to do. So now if white were to play this move, well, we're not compelled to take right away because we have the e8 square in this line. And if white tries to go with the same idea, I don't think it's as strong. It's still annoying and you have to be aware of. So we're protecting here. And I think I think black is going to get in e5 awfully quickly. So I think this is this is a slightly improved way, but then again, I'm I'm not following uh, I'm not looking at the opening book. So it's possible that rookie eight is is a book move, but to me it just I'd rather get my pawn break in before I play rookie eight. Okay, so rook e8, rook e1, now e5. Well, once black plays rook e8, he's, he's kind of signaling that he's going to go for e5 rather than c5. Um, actually, now that I say that, that's not true. You could get c5 in. Okay, now in this position, c5, I think e5 would be... Yeah, it would be quite strong with the tempo here. Okay, anyway, let's let's get on with it. So e5, and white has blocked it up. Now, there's different ways to play this. Um, J bent went with c6, which makes sense. You're attacking the pawn chain, pawn chain here at the at the front. Uh, another common way of going about this, uh, and it, unfortunately it would involve moving the rook back to f8, but knight h5 and f5. Because generally a rule of thumb is you want to play on the side of the board that your pawns are pointing. So if we look at black's pawns, they're pointing towards the king side. Whereas white's pawns are more on the queen side. So in a lot of King's Indian games, black plays on the king side, white plays on the queen side. But with modern chess, there's been lots of games shown that black doesn't have to play on the king side. You can actually play on the center here and perhaps play on the queen side as well. So c6 is uh, is a common move. So. Um, so white played b4. White can take, and you could say, well, he's got a back, he's got a uh, backwards pawn here um, on an open file, but it's not so easy for white to take advantage of. So let's say if white were to play b4 here, um, I was thinking like maybe knight f8. 
let's go bishop to a3, perhaps, just pointing at this. Um, after knight e6, actually, maybe bishop g4 first. Bishop g4. Uh, the thing is, if white goes for something like this, don't think it's all that great, because I'm looking at the d4 square in particular. So we could actually take, and then knight e6, looking at the d4 square. And we've gotten rid of our weak pawn. And yeah, we both have weak pawns here, but they're not easily attacked. So note that white can't take here because of the pin. So a lot of times when black plays c6, white doesn't take. White basically has to have a really good reason to take on c6. So white in this game plays b4. And uh, j bent plays a5. Which is a common reply. So in the game, white played b5. And the idea behind a5, especially when this rook is not protected, uh, white cannot afford to play a3 because this is just a free pawn. If white were to take, rook takes rook. I'm just curious if white could play uh, what Kramnik had popularized, kind of like the bayonet attack, but I don't think it's quite working here. So Kramnik's idea, and it, it's when the pawn is on c7, he would play, it would look like he made a, a strategic blunder with b4 because he can't play a3, but he would actually play bishop to a3. Now it doesn't quite work in this, uh, in this setup, and I'll show you in a second. But just imagine if the pawn were still on uh, c7, white then goes uh, for a4 and a5 and uh, unfortunately in this position it doesn't quite work because black has uh, c5 and wherever we go with the bishop we're losing it so the bayonet attack idea doesn't quite work here so really I think white had uh, made the, a reasonable decision with b5. I suppose he could have tried rook to b1. Um, and maybe then go a4 and kind of try with the, the bayonet attack idea. But I don't know. I don't know how strong that would be in this position. I mean, engine is showing equals, which makes sense to me. I don't think white has much there. Okay, well, let's see what happens. So b5 was played in the game. And j-bent took on b5 with the pawn. And now white took with the knight, which is interesting, because white is uh, trying to target the d6 square. You can imagine bishop to a3 and going after here. The only downside is that, you know, if he had taken with the pawn, he would have had use of the open c-file, but... Uh, maybe he's trying to make use of the open B file instead. Not sure if that's any better. Yeah. I feel like taking here is a little more natural. But I suppose it's it's not gonna it's not gonna be easy for white to break through on the on the queen side, especially since black has always got this knight c5. Okay, well let's see let's see how it went. So uh, knight takes b5, knight c5 as advertised. White wants to hold on to the bishop, and J bent secures the knight. Okay, so white cements his knight on b5, 
and we've got a locked uh, center. Uh, things aren't open, so whenever the center is locked, play has to happen on the wings. So we've got potential activity on the C file. Maybe some could go on the B file, but chances are black is going to focus their attention on the king side and maybe combine that with play on the queen side. And uh, let's see how J bent, what kind of plan J bent chose. So bishop a6, probably just wants to get rid of that knight because it's kind of pesky. You really don't want to keep your queen here protecting that pawn. So bishop a6 makes sense. Bishop a3, I gotta stop hitting the right mouse button. Got a new mouse, so I'm still learning the the feel of it. Okay, so takes takes, and rooks belong on open files. So excellent move. This rook now on an open file, and that is a beautiful knight. The only way you can get rid of it is by taking it. So that knight is cemented in there. Okay, rook to c1. White also knows that rooks belong on open files. And now J Bent says, hey, I want to bring my other rook on an open file. Makes sense. Queen to d2. Um, yeah, I don't quite know why White did that. It does connect the rooks, but you know maybe white is eventually going to try to double up. But see, white white's in a, a bit of an awkward situation here. The e4 pawn is tender because you got two knights on it, and in order for white to double up, you got to move this bishop. You got to be careful where you move the bishop. If you move the bishop here. You always have to be aware of knight b3 ideas. Um, and if you go bishop to d1, well, that is getting in the way of your two rooks. So it's almost going to like, yeah, it's, it's going to be tough for white to rearrange here. Because whenever you do move this bishop, you're uh, losing protection over e4. So the engine says slightly better for black. I would definitely prefer black in this setup, but of course I'm comfortable with the king's Indian defense. So uh, yeah, you naturally want to play positions that you're comfortable in. Okay, so let's see what white did. Okay, white's going to try rook e2 and then rook c2, I suspect. Maybe that's what they were planning. But I think this, this move actually gives white some problems later on because in particular, uh, it disconnects the rooks and the rooks like to defend each other. And we'll see later on how important that is. Now, J bent plays knight to g4. And on first look, that's not the uh, common maneuver. Uh, in the King's Indian, uh, a lot of the times you go knight h5, trying to plop the knight into here. You can combine it with f5. But I really like the idea that J. Bent came up with. It's a real nice idea. So after knight g4, I don't think white necessarily saw the idea. Very good, nerdy Asian guy. Yes, exactly. So white said, I'm tired of that knight. He took the knight. So now he's relieved a little bit of pressure. But black knight has really nice pressure on the C file. And white plays h4. Because white realizes that he's in trouble on this diagonal. And I wonder, can he get away with... What if he were to play queen to d1, 
bishop to h6. And then let's say rook to b1. So white is holding just barely though. What about queen c7 here? Adding a third attacker. And then bishop to d3, it's... He's holding on by a thread. Black is definitely better here. Um, in hindsight, I think this was probably the way for white to go, and then try to get in h3 to kick this knight back. Because the way that white played got into some trouble. So let's see how the game went. So white, I suspect, saw this idea of bishop to h6, and that's why they played h4, because after bishop to h6, they don't want to lose the rook, and so they played knight g5. And bishop h6 really proves the purpose behind knight g4, the knight, the knight is holding on to the bishop. So this is very awkward here for, for white. I mean, this is a dream position for black. In fact, the engines of eval bar, if you can see it, shows uh, 2.6 in black's favor. So the engine thinks that black already is up two and a half pawns here, which if you count the material is not true because the material is even, but uh, that's how strong of a positional advantage black has here. So. Now, I think this is a very instructive moment. And when I was going through this, um, this is what I had thought. So the game went f6, f3. So unfortunately, black's knight is trapped as well. So we essentially get a trade of knights. Now, unfortunately, black cannot play takes the pawn because, whoop, we lose the bishop. And so king to g7 makes sense. But then white had a really nice idea. He said, okay, I'm not going to let you free that bishop. So the bishop here is um, a big pawn at the moment. Now, still better for black, but I thought black had a better way to uh, utilize his advantage. So let's actually go back. And this is, this is a hard thing to do in chess, and this is one thing that I've learned from watching a lot of Grandmaster games. So in this position, rather than what was played in the game, f6, you can say, well, white is all tied up here. This knight can't move, because lose the queen, and there's a lot of pressure on this bishop. The bishop can't move at the moment, because that would drop the rook. So you start to think, well, what could white do if I just simply improve my position? Let's not rush things. So f6 was, is basically saying, okay, let's, let's uh, change the dynamics of the position. Let's, um, you know, it basically forces f3, which leads to some trades. But what if we instead play a move like queen c7? So the question is, what are you going to do as white? You can't move the bishop. You can't move this rook. If you move this rook, well, then that drops the bishop. I mean, maybe you can shuffle the queen. Uh, queen d7, uh, d7, d1. Um, and now, what was I looking at earlier? Yeah, then I thought, okay, well, the knight is really um, finished with his purpose here. Yeah, it's kind of like a giant zugzwang. Basically, just slowly improve your position. So I was thinking in this position, let's, because we want to play f6 at some point, let's go knight f6. So we bring the rook back, uh, the, the rook, the knight back, and let's just say 
white uh, again just shuffles the queen back. I mean, maybe there's better moves from white, but I'm not seeing too many. And then I was looking at knight h5. So targeting this square. And again, the knight still can't move. The bishop still can't move. I mean, this is just a a dream position for black. It's, it's as if you're playing without an opponent. Uh, without an opponent. That's how good the position is. And so maybe white has to play g3 here to take away uh, knight f4. And so in this position, if we go f6, well, knight e6 is annoying because it hits the queen and the rook. So what was I looking at? Ah, okay. Well, we can continue to apply the pressure. Rook d2, queen d1, queen c5. So now we're pinning the f pawn. We're threatening either rook takes a pawn or knight takes g3. So I think I would have proceeded in this manner. Just slowly increase the pressure, increase the pressure, increase the pressure. Um, Kind of like Karpov, play like a boa constrictor. Just keep squeezing and squeezing and squeezing. I think this would have uh, this would have been very unpleasant for White to play. Now that being said, let's go back to the game. The way that Jay Bent did play it, uh, still very very good. Uh, still has an advantage. So let's go f6, f3. So this is the game. So we've got a trade of minor pieces. King to g7, h5, takes. Now, white doesn't want to take because then that opens up uh, g4 and we've got our skewer. So white correctly ignores that and plays rook to f2. So you can see the evaluation is still minus 2 for uh, black. So black is still very, very much, uh, well, better in winning it. Uh, at this point but one thing again I'll, I'll read it what, what I've learned from grandmasters and it, it, it's really hard to do to have uh, great patience um, but I would have I would have gone for Queen c7 and increase the pressure because when you do that when you don't change the dynamics like of a position and, and you know trade pieces or, or force something you're basically squeezing your opponent, and unless you're playing a computer, um, when when you're playing a human, that's tough to deal with. It's tough to defend when you're like, oh, I'm getting squeezed here. Like, I, I got no moves. Like, I can't really do much. And what happens is that leads to mistakes, and and you're likely to get an, get an opponent that makes even bigger mistakes. So anyway, that, that would be my, my tip for... Uh, for this game, but uh, the way that J-Bend has played it here is, is certainly fine as well. So rook f2, okay, takes the pawn. I mean, even even uh, here, uh, the position is just so bad for white. Um, still can't move this bishop. So that's that's why earlier in the game, when, when white played rook e2, I didn't like it, because, yeah, rooks like to protect each other. And this is this is one reason. With this uh, power on the C file, you really don't want to have your rooks disconnected like that. Okay, so J Bent says, "All right, I'm going to give up that pawn." He says, "Now yeah, what the hell? I'll give up another one." Why? Well, unleashing that beast. Now this requires calculation, and J Bent did uh, calculate this. So white decided not to take queens. So if white were to take queens, well now bishop hits rook. Once the rook moves, we're winning the bishop. So let's say double up. Well, actually, <laughs> that's even better. <laughs> yeah. Can win the exchange here. 
Um, yeah, it's just nasty. So white correctly keeps the queens on. When you're when you're losing or in a much worse position, you want to keep as much material on because that allows you to create more threats. And so you know you you hope to be able to weasel out a draw. So white correctly keeps the queens on. And this is good calculation by uh, J. Bent because a lot of people would say, oh man, my king, I gave up two pawns in front of my king. My king is wide open, but that only matters if white can take advantage of it. And, and J. Bent correctly assessed that, well, look, I've got my queen, and if need be, I could bring a rook over. So I've got all the squares covered. I don't see how white can take advantage of the fact that my king's a little exposed. Okay, so uh, double up. And uh, yeah, that, that bishop, it's tough to suggest a move. I mean, if white were to go here, um, yeah, you could even just take here. And it looks like there's some potential back rank issues, but Rook f8 is never possible because of the bishop blocks. Uh, queen d8 and queen c8 are covered. So the only move that white has is queen to e8, but then we just bring the queen back. And white would love to win the queen with rook f8, but of course can't do that. And I think this is kind of what happens in the game. Black forces a simplification. So here's the game. So double up, takes, white takes, yeah, this is exactly what happened. And uh, yeah, white decided to trade here, probably at this point it, it's safe to resign, but he played on. So let's see how J Bent finished this one. A check, and then puts the bishop here, nice and solid. Rook e6, check. We pick off some pawns. And now we bring our king into the endgame. Kings are important pieces in the endgame. They can help with defense. They can help with attack. Okay, rook there is, I mean, optically that looks a little strange. Um, what's wrong with just going here and here? Oh, I see. The rook is preventing the king from getting... Ahead, maybe maybe this would be more precise because now the king is coming, and you can use the rook to, to block the checks. Anyway, that's just a minor a minor detail, really. Um, ah, okay, that was the idea. You want to push the pawn? Makes sense. And now the king comes. Okay, I see the idea. Very nice. Now, it looks like uh, black has blundered here. And in fact, he does give up material, but he realizes that this is a completely one king and pawn endgame. So very good simplification by uh, J, B J. Bent. And so at this point, white resigned. And uh, yeah, white can win this pawn while he's busy scooping up that pawn, black is going to eat these two pawns, and one of these guys is going to queen. So impressive game by Jay Bent. So thank you very much, Jay Bent, for the game. Appreciate that. And if you have another game uh, that you'd like me to analyze, by all means, please do share with us in the Discord channel. And anybody else, if, if you have a game that you'd like to analyze, please do post it in our Discord.